now we start with Larry Turley, who's got the most amazing story. Who knew? And he makes really amazing wine. And, um, and in fact, when he first started his winery, he drove the same model of motorcycle that I drove. Uh, so we do share that in common. Other than that, he's much brighter than I am. Uh, Larry, you started out uh, a long time ago in an unusual location for a guy who ended up being a winemaker. Well, there's a lot of varied backgrounds here, but uh, I think I'm the only one that was preordained to be in the wine business. I grew up in the South, uh, where it was demon alcohol, and I'll have to <laughs> refer back to the accent at the time, uh, which usually only comes out after the second bottle. But uh, <clears throat> I was in Sunday school at age 10, and a teacher in a blue sharkskin suit, I kid you not, asked me, Larry, Larry, now, would you drive a beer truck for $40 a week, or would you dig ditches for $30 a week? And I said, with my perfect accent, I'd drive that beer truck. <laughs> so they said, well, what about our creed? And I said, well, our Lord changed water into wine. And they said, no, it wasn't. It was water. And I said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> Out I got kicked, and I never looked back. <laughs> so I've been kicked out of a lot of places. Uh, <laughs> I left, uh, I started various schools. I never graduated from college. I did graduate from medical school. Um, I, left, I left the medical school in Georgia uh, by mutual consent. <laughs> Finished up in New Mexico and just kept heading west. Uh, started uh, I made beer all through medical school, and that was interesting, but that's another story. Um, so I came out to California, bought an old place, and uh, the first day that I owned it, somebody camped in my front yard. I'd been working all night in the ER. So, as you did in those days, I drove my motorcycle through the tent. Um, was, <laughs> and there was a small fellow in there, and I said, what are you doing? And he looked up at me, pulled out a bottle of wine from underneath his pillow and said, I was about to have a glass of wine. And that was John Williams, and we went on to start Frog Sleep together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I think it was him uh, late one night that came up with our motto as, time's fun when you're having flies. <laughs> so <clears throat> we moved on from that, and I, I really liked Zinfandel, so in 93, I lived right at the winery, and I had... Uh, a young family, so I sold John the label. He moved, uh, has done very well since then. And I started a small winery. I didn't know anything else besides my name, so I used that. And I started with three wines, and uh, I was at, I think, the second Zap, uh, the old next to Green's restaurant. Um, it was quite a little different back then, but very, very focused. Um, I put the vineyard names on them, and within 24 hours, other wineries that had contacted all of my growers offering to buy the wines. I said, huh, I must be on to something here. I now make 35 wines. That's a great business model, I got to tell you. So you, you, uh, you had a, a series of winemakers, but uh, everybody thinks that your sister makes the wines. Um, and in fact, at one point, she did make a couple of the wines. So does she still make all the wines, Larry? Now, just because I'm from the South, you had to drag the family in. <laughs> So Helen got, helped us get started in 93 and 94, and then she fired me. And I said, how do you fire an owner? And little did I know that I was the founding member of the Fired Owners Club of Helen Turley. <laughs> There's quite a few of us now. So Aaron Jordan was working with us at the time, and I said, oh my God, what are we going to do? And he said, oh, I can do it. I said, oh, that's reassuring. Uh, <laughs> But he did, and did a fabulous job for almost 20 years. And Tegan Pasalacqua, common spelling, is uh, the winemaker and head of the, uh, the vineyard now. And I, I've been very fortunate. I've never been a winemaker uh, or uh, claimed to be. I, I'm not sure of my position, but when somebody handed me my business card and it said debtor on it, I guess that's my <laughs> position. <laughs> so we, we started with the three, three wines. Um, they're all older vineyards at that time, uh, from before 1910. What was interesting in 
it'll go so back. So you have questionable morals, too. <laughs> <laughs> Me thinketh he protests us too much. <laughs> uh, so I have 14 vineyards now that are more than 100 years old. And I think what's really intriguing about them is there are many, many more vineyards at, at the great social experiment of, uh, of uh, prohibition. And you couldn't make a living once that came in. So they would pull out and planted walnuts and prunes. But they were very proud. And they said, I cannot pull out this five or this six acres. It's too great. And they kept that. So we're we are really kept with the greatest vineyards that, that were planted during that time. I was asked the other day, well, how do you assess an old vine vineyard? I said, I don't need to. It was planted in the right spot. They kept the best of the best. Uh, we've converted them all to old, to um, organic farming. Uh, I was born on an organic farm in Tennessee. My dad grew cotton and tobacco organically. You know, here, have a healthy cigarette. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, we've had great luck with the vineyards. Uh, I obviously am a great proponent of them. One of the things that's really intriguing to me is the people that planted vineyards during Prohibition. Now, you could make 200 gallons of sacramental wine, and, but I say they were either eternal optimists or they knew somebody in Chicago. Um, we're going to taste a, a couple of, uh, well, one th I want to say that I've, followed wherever their old vines. So people have come to us and say, I've got this old vine vineyard. It's going to White Zen now. And uh, I'm a big proponent of White Zen. It saved many, many old vineyards. Um, In fact, so, you make one. Yeah, that's true. Thank Except my daughter. it's dry. <laughs> uh, so we went to, uh, down to Paso Robles, Templeton, uh, Amador County, we farm in nine different counties, 35 different vineyards. We do 95 different picks a year. We bought the old Carly winery up in Amador County. Uh, he used to be in charge of all of the atomic weapons in the United States. He married a rocket, and uh, he was, they were living in LA and moved to Plymouth. Uh, probably not 10 people know where Plymouth is. And somebody said, why did you move up there? And he said, well, my wife wanted to garden naked. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. So, so a quick, quick thing about the, the wines here. The, the Hain Vineyard is our real, real flagship wine. It was planted in 1904, a Bourne family. They were, uh, had enough means to keep the vineyard intact and farm it all during Prohibition. So after Prohibition, a lot of the budwood for new vineyards came from there. In fact, we took the budwood from there to our estate and then from our estate on up to the Rattlesnake Ridge. I used to get pretty puffed up about how high Rattlesnake Ridge is. It's 2,400 feet. It's one of the higher vineyards in the Napa Valley. Unfortunately, I just came back from Argentina. I don't think I was ever below 3,000 feet there. And the highest ones are at 9,000 feet, which is really unique. Uh, these two, the Hain Vineyard, so it was planted in 1904. Rattlesnake Ridge uh, is named for the ridge that we look at, not where we are. Um, it was planted 15 years ago, same budwood. Uh, the Hain Vineyard is planted old style, 10 by 10, head trained, dry farmed. Um, we converted it about in 93 to organic. We had this great idea to plant tight space Zinfandel because I didn't know how to plant an old vine vineyard. I said, how do you plant a 100-year-old vine? I still don't know. So we planted uh, three by six, thinking we could get all this concentration. And God almighty, it's a lot of work. Uh, so we, we irrigate this. Uh, I don't know of anybody, perhaps somebody else does, of uh, any vineyards that of that density have been dry farmed. Um, two very, very different wines. Um, I like both of them very much. It depends on what I'm eating. Um, I, we've gone back to planting all old style now, 10 by 10, dry farm, St. George. Um, I think they were on to something back then. Um, I had very similar background to some of the people that said they got their inheritance. Uh, as Joel said, 
you know, there's oil people in the wine business. And so I sold my motorcycle, and it had some oil in it, and it helped me. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't use as much oak. Uh, we, we try to, I, I don't know, people are talking about alcohol. Of course there's alcohol in it. Jesus Christ, what's the purpose? <laughs> uh, Spoken like a real Southern Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> we... So we pick it when we think it's ripe, okay? And uh, we don't crush any. Uh, we took the crusher off the destemmer. And we use, uh, we cold soak it for three to five days. We don't add any laboratory yeast. Uh, we do fairly long, here's the religious side coming in again. Sometimes we do 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if you don't crush and then you ferment, and then when you press, you get uh, maybe a point, point and a half of sugar from the berries that ha haven't been uh, broken. And so it finishes fermentation in the barrel. It takes a while, and then sometimes not until the next summer do we finish with uh, malolactic. So it takes, it's a risky time because there's nothing besides the alcohol pre preserving it. Uh, but we, we've had great luck with that, and we uh, think that we retain a lot of uh, the original flavors. And that's about all. Do you have any questions? I mean, I don't have to answer them, do I? No, no but I think that uh, you, you've, uh, you, your wine, wine style has changed a little bit. Those early wines that Helen made had some residual sugar, and they were like over 15% alcohol, maybe 16. And I know alcohol is like important to you uh, in many ways. But in recent history, the wines seem to be proportioned differently, and they're, you know, they're quite delicious. You know? Yeah, and I think it maybe speaks to what Carol was talking about, uh, about uh, not getting grapes overripe and showing terroir, because I know that you, know, you really uh, ex exhibit that in those, in those 400 different wines you make. <laughs> Siri is even disagreeing with him. <laughs> That's a real insult. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh. Well, um, yeah, we, one, one wine we did had residual sugar, uh, and it stopped fermenting at 18%. Uh, Parker came and tasted it, thought it tasted great. Aaron and I looked at each other and said, should we tell him that it has residual sugar? And so I said, well, what did you think of the sugar? And he got a funny look on his face and didn't say anything. So we put, on that particular year, it was the Moore Vineyard, we put a hourglass with all the sand, I didn't want to call it late harvest, so we put an hourglass with all the sand in the bottom. <laughs> so. so if you ever see that, that's code for I'm really getting along. <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, that's great, Larry. I mean, you know, you've, you've made delicious wines, you've you know, changed the, um, uh, the way people think about Zinfandel, uh, and I, for one, am grateful that you have focused on Dry farming and organics, you've really been a leader in that. So thank you so much. My pleasure.